and welcome to a quite a grey sunrise safari. My name is Brent Pierre Smith. I do apologize if we are having some audio difficulties this morning, but we will have them sorted quickly. So it is drizzling, believe it or not. Uh, as I said, it's unlikely we're gonna get any major rain again uh, before November, but we are prone to a little bit of bad weather. But if you're a cat, it's wonderful. So hopefully we'll find some cats on the move. So we're going to go look for those lions, but first I'm afraid we do have to try to sort our audio and it shouldn't take too long. I have a Brian Joubert on camera. There he is, and the thumb. And what is on the thumb? Oh, it's got a tie. It's very businesslike today. Brian is ready for some serious business of camera work. And we have Rebecca and Geraldine in final control. And we have Sam and Jandre out on the other vehicle. But as you can see, not much of a sunrise to see this morning. And Fortunately, the drizzle has stopped a little and uh, it will hopefully hold off for the rest of the sunrise safari and we'll be able to show you all sorts of weird, wild and wonderful creatures. So, let's go check quarantine for lion traps. It's a chilly 19 degrees Celsius, 66 degrees Fahrenheit. And of course, what we consider chilly 
is a balmy, warm day for a lot of our viewers in the north. That's why one would choose to live where there is snow, I do not understand. So a lot of you will notice I popped a picture on yesterday and I was lucky enough to go exploring and learning a little bit more about how thingamajigs and jigamajags work. For those of you who are not sure what thingamajigs and jigamajags are, that's how we get the picture to you. So there's a thingamajig on the back of the vehicle that sends a jigamajag to the top of a mountain. And I happened to visit the top of that mountain yesterday. Uh, very interesting. Uh, very exciting stuff. Well, not so much the thingamajigs and the jigamajags. I was just ecstatic to be on top of the mountain looking at a type of fanbos and incredible flowers. We also saw a monkey species that only occurs in this, in this area, in this incredible mist belt forest that occurs from about 800 meters to 1,400 meters above sea level. And it is basically the belt where the mist sits, strangely enough. Uh, made up of wonderful trees, yellow woods and stink woods and we saw a samango monkey and, and a bushbuck. That was about it from a, the wildlife point of view. We did get to see some cape vultures flying below us. Now, that cliff is incredible. I mean, it's 1,900 meters above sea level. Absolutely stunning. Ah, oh, Sarah, one of our regulars. Uh, Sarah's 18 years old, and one of her school projects was a research paper on the Inkahuma Pride Dynamics. And excellent news. Um, it has been published by her school newspaper. Well done, Sarah. Uh, Sarah, be sure, uh, if there is a digital version of that paper, uh, pop it on Twitter, or even email it to us. And if you want to do that, you can for other people who don't know how to email and tweet just yet, our email address is questions at wildearth.tv um, or you can just use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So I am speaking ridiculously loudly because my lapel mic is not working. So I'm trying to make sure you can hear me through the fluffy mic on top. I should be able to sort this out in about 30 seconds, hopefully. As we go in to fix our sound, uh, let's jump on board with Sam. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the northeast part of South Africa, the Sabi Sands. I am Sam Chevalier. It is great to meet all of you. This is my second drive for Wild Earth TV. It's been a very, very, very exciting two days since I just arrived and wow, it's what an experience. I think I'm gonna be meeting a whole new bunch of people this morning as last night is a, is a different group of people. So welcome, thank you for listening to me and being part of my first drives. Uh, Rebecca is in the, as the director today. We have Jandre behind camera. Jandre. And um, yes, it's been raining a little bit, which is great, you know. As John Ray was explaining to me, this is almost like a hurricane in the Sabi Sands um, in terms of, you know, the weather and the drought and all of that. Um, but this morning, we're going to go, we're going to head and just drive around. Pretty much, I don't really know the roads yet. I'm learning all the roads. John Ray is pointing me in different directions. Uh, so I'm still learning the ecology, learning the, the parts of this, this area. So it's all quite difficult at the moment, but extremely, extremely exciting. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, to getting to know the landscape and understanding where the leopards might be, where, they, where their territories are. So it's all really exciting. You know when that feeling when you go to somewhere new and there's just so much to see and do. Um, so welcome to Safari Live with Sam and Jean-Dre this morning. Wow. 
you wouldn't be able to feel this, but there's a, quite a strong drizzle that's coming onto my face. And um, th this is, you know, this is exciting. But as I said yesterday, when I last came here, the bush felt was extremely, extremely dry. So to have this rain is so important. This, I can, last time I just noticed how thirsty the bush was, and it just looks like it's drinking. It's drinking up all this water. So all this water is great. Of course, it might create technical diff difficulties a bit later if it rains a bit harder and we'll have to stop the show, but that's okay. It's gonna be great. I still find it amazing uh, that I'm talking into a camera that can be listened to, you know, whoever wants to in the world. So I always find that quite intimidating as I look into that camera, look into the eyes of everyone else. As I said yesterday, it's such a, such a great opportunity to be able to go out into the bush and to, and to go, with, go with a whole bunch of people that are also interested, you know. I truly believe that shared experiences will bring our, bring people together and, and, and for a conservation and ecological point of view, so important. So we can better understand the way in which ecosystems work and just learn together, it's great. Kathy in Tennessee, I'm also really excited. I'm excited to be on drive with you. It's, yeah, yesterday I was exceptionally nervous. Today I'm feeling a little bit better. Um, Jean-Andre has been amazing behind the camera, keeping me nice and you know, focused and all of that. But Kathy, I'm excited. Let's see what we can find. I'm really hoping that we can come across um, a leopard this morning. I still haven't seen a leopard. So it will be a first for me if we get to see that but we are coming across a watering hole. So I'm just gonna keep it down a little bit and drive slowly across. And the viewers yesterday got quite excited, or well, at least I got quite excited, um, to start a bird list. And I'm just gonna get a bird book. from New Zealand, yes. I'm looking to, to get as many as I can. I've got my bird book, and I've got this book here. And now I'm just trying to find my pen. So, it's been really exciting to be able to, uh, to learn the birds again, because I haven't been in the bush for over a year and a half. And so my bird knowledge and everything is very, very rusty. And so I, I thought it would be a really good idea to, to start a bird list with all of you and, and whoever's new on the show. Like, you know, this could be an opportunity where we can grow one together. So I'll quickly say where we are. Yesterday, we just managed to get uh, four birds. We, get the, we had the magpie shrike, the red bull oxpecker, the blacksmith plover, which was the tinking bird, and the crested Franklin, which makes an awful racket sometimes and runs in front of your vehicle. I uh, always get excited when I see the crested Franklin, old friend. And here we are at the watering hole. Can we see anything? I've just been informed by Rebecca, who's the new director, and she is, this is the first drive I'm going on with Rebecca, so I'm very excited. Thank you, Rebecca. And she's just informed me that this is Treehouse Dam. So slowly but surely, I'm learning the roads and learning the dams and understanding the area. But it doesn't seem like I can see any birds at the watering hole. The types of birds that we might be able to see at the watering hole are gray herons, once again, the blacksmith plover. You can see the black crake, or African jacanas. So we just have to look and see if we can see anything. Can you see anything, Jandro? OK, 
show. It's better not to force them out. Maybe when we're just driving on our way, we'll see a bird or two, and we'll take that to our list. At the moment, Okay, excuse me everyone, I'm just going to call Brent. I need to use the other one. Brent, go ahead. I'm struggling to get audio. Um, would you be able to re relay the message through to Rebecca and I'll hear from her? For some reason, the volume is not so high. Cool. So it's, it's an interesting thing trying to to use the use and get to know the vehicle as well as everything. There's so much complexity involved in starting the job. And I just found that the sound is not so, I can't hear it that well when I'm talking to the other presenters out there. Brent has just informed me that there are leopard tracks in this area. Um, there's a potential for mating leopards in this area. We just spoke about seeing a leopard, so I'm gonna drive slowly and see if we can find any tracks of the leopard and see if we can work them. And hopefully, with all of you, we may experience a leopard. For me, for the first time, and maybe for many viewers, the first time for you too. So let's, let's take this. It's a live safari. This, we don't know what's gonna happen. We'll have to see. Work these tracks, we're gonna link you back to Brent. I'll see you just now. So exciting news! Mating leopard back again, it sounds like. They crossed during the night. Oh, sorry, Taxon's just trying to get hold of me. Standing by. Firm. Uh, it was the other one that was uh, chasing the bird. Sorry, guys, back to you in a sec. Yeah, Firm, he seems to be better now. He's not in must anymore. He seems to be better now. He's not in must anymore. Okay, so we're in search of tracks. Um, Taxon is coming in from the west. Aubrey's going straight to where the tracks are. Sam's somewhere in the middle. So we're gonna take the east. Are you in the mood for leopards? I am indeed. Yes, let's be in the mood for leopards, then we shall find them. Sorry, guys. The Game Drive channel is incredibly busy this morning. Good morning, Michael. Go ahead. Hey, firm. Thanks, copy, Mark. Yeah, um, Aubrey's going to last tracks, taxes checking from Zoe's side, and um, we're checking Weaver's Nest uh, through to the boundary. So, coordinating a multi-pronged search for the mating leopards. And as you can see, we do apologize for the speckles of damp that are appearing on the... Wonderful it is to have a little bit of rain, which Koi was asking, are we expecting rain? We weren't, but we now have it. Uh, but it does make tracking a little bit difficult. This light is 
uh, in, in traffic, uh, for tracking, one would describe it as probably horrific. So I will be using my spotlight not to shine off into the bush, but to just see if I can see what's on the road. But that is a hyena. So not what we we're in search of. So onward. So it seems like it is still Tundi. So Tundi and Tingana that are still mating. And it must be getting towards the end of their little honeymoon, one would say. Now, quite a lot of people wonder, but we saw that we've seen them mating. I think this is the third time now. So it's not every time that when leopards and lions mate that they actually get impregnated. And it's not uncommon for the same female to mate three or four times before she actually uh, gets impregnated. But if we do find them today, it's going to be very interesting if we watch the behavior compared to a few days ago when we saw them and the mating was still very aggressive. Uh, towards the end, it sort of has a little bit of lackluster and they don't mate as frequently. So if we work it out now, it's probably in four or five days. Copy, well done, Orbs. Um, I'm at Pangolin Track. Let me just find out if Sam's closer. Okay, so they found Tingana, and I haven't seen Tandakila, the loved one, yet. And I, I'm a little bit relieved. This weather is not great for walking and tracking. So it seems like they made it a little bit easy for us. So I wonder where we're going to try and find out. So Steph says, I thought Tingana made his escape. Did she chase him down? She most certainly did. Female leopards are very, very focused when it comes to mating and they will keep on looking for uh, that male. So I just need to be on the game drive again here. Yeah? Sam, Sam. Sam, what's your position? Oh, uh, copy, they've got uh, those leopards. I'm just trying to figure out which one of us is closer. Um, uh, they're at on Shabam Road. That's affirmative. Sorry, I'm going to be with you in a sec. Uh, Sam, I think I'm a little bit closer, but if you'd like to go there, you're more than welcome. Sorry, guys, just walk. Oh. Okay, we're gonna get. Um, Sam's a bit closer. He's a treehouse dam, and those leopards are just down the road there. Oh, it's starting to get a little bit wet. Mm. So, Brian, I know we're in the mood for leopards, but should we do lions? Might as well. Might as might well, as might as well. Let's go see if we can find them cool, my ladies. Oh. Oh, no, we are on our way to the leopards, apparently. Sorry, change of plan, Brian. We are in the mood for leopards. Yay, Brian is very happy. The thumb in his business suit is very happy. I am slightly not so happy, and that's nothing to do with the leopards. Sorry guys, I'm just figuring out where they're moving. But as you can see, it's suddenly got a little bit more damp. 
And I'm, I'm not so happy because I thought, you know, I'm really tough. And it's not going to rain that much, and I don't need a big jacket. Of course, I was wrong. And now I'm being pelted with small raindrops. A rainy leopard day. Oh, it sounds like they've changed direction. They're actually going to head straight at Sam. Sorry about a bit of confusion. Sam's having a bit of problems with his game drive comms. So, Sam's right there. The leopards are about to walk into him. So, again, Brian, we're going looking for lions. <laughs> One second. Oh. Well, we're going to be... I'm going to have my second shower for the day. Orbs, um, Sam is, is right at Treehouse Dam, so he's going to move into that area. I'm going to go check for Uncle Umas. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys, it seems like that uh, Sam and jean are having a bit of uh, water issues with their camera, so they're going to be down for a bit. So uh, you're st stuck with the killer bees. Yeah. So Orby's just lost those leopards in a very thick block. And of course, we are quite adept at sneaking through thick blocks. Uh, the reason is because our, our vehicles are a little bit shorter than normal game drive vehicles. We're able to get in and out of places that some of the bigger vehicles are not. Oh, yes, I'm being shouted at by Brian. Not shouted at, oh, so Just asked, easy. yes, but we are getting too much water now. Do you want your, your dress? There you go. Now, I definitely did not predict this weather. So what I think we're going to do, if it carries on getting a bit harder, uh, we might have to go and have a, a, a break and maybe wait for it to, to stop. Of course, we've got lots of very expensive equipment, but that doesn't bother me so much as the electrical equipment. And I don't think you want to see Brian and I um, or our hair standing there. So what I'm going to try to do is get into those leopards. Um, we can have a quick view of those leopards before um, the rain gets any harder. Uh, and then judging uh, once we're with those leopards, because we're not going to be moving as much, so the rain's not going to affect, affect us as much, uh, we'll make the call from there. I didn't bring a big jacket, but at least I did bring one of my numerous multi-coloured Kenyan devices, which helps with a bit of warmth. It's getting quite hard, huh? Yes, this is getting quite hot. So, what we, as I said, we're going to try and get to those depths quickly, give you a quick view, and if this carries on, I'm afraid we are going to have to take a, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a respite. Stay. Naughty, naughty rain cover. <laughs> OK. 
chat. We're very close by now. Aubrey, Aubrey. Oh, yeah. Now something has gone incredibly wrong. There we go. Orbs, um, coming up Elephant Skull from Weaver's Nest. Uh, have you still got visual? Thanks. Do you want me to check uh, savages? Copy, thanks. So they have gone into an incredibly difficult area. So we have lost many a leopard in this very small block because it is very thick. says they're walking up and down, so maybe Tingana is trying to shake his lady friend again. Brian, you must let me know if we get too wet well, in our search for leopards. Heard that it sounds like they snuck past us. Yeah, so I didn't see any tracks. Okay, so all we just said they're making quite a bit of noise. So we're just going to sit quietly for a second while we do that. Um, make sure they don't sneak up on Brian. Uh, Natasha is wondering, will they keep mating till she gets pregnant? No, that is not the case. She has a very set Easter cycle, and uh, she will stop mating, and if she doesn't get pregnant, she'll start mating again the next time that Easter cycle comes along. Sorry. Standing by, James. close to the boundary again, so that's going to blow off because I'm going to have to drive quite quickly. So we're just going to try and get one, what do you say, Brian, one good view, and then we're going to call it for a little bit till the rain eases up a bit. Sounds good. So, of course we want to bring you the best safari possible, but we also want to still be able to do a safari in the afternoon, and that's why we might have to take a little break. Hopefully the weather will ease up. The problem with this type of weather is it comes in waves. So at the moment, we're like, ooh, it's not so bad. And then we get further and further away from camp, and then suddenly, for the next 10 minutes, it'll come down much harder. And then, ooh, it'll be not so bad. But we'll keep, we will keep trucking on while we can.
Sorry, I'm just listening to a game drive comms. I need to know where exactly where these uh, leopards are. Standing by. Copy thanks, James. All sorted. Okay, so the leopards are here somewhere. I just really need my ears for a second just to find out exactly where Aubrey has located the, the felines. Watch your head, Ryan. There we go. Now this is our southern, the southern edge of our traverse. Oh dear, they've disappeared again. I'm going to check. <coughs> Copy, thanks. Go ahead, Sam. Okay, so they've disappeared into these monkey orange stickers again, so it's going to pop ourselves a little bit high. And Taxon's standing by there. Aubrey's there. I think we'll go just beyond them and do the same. We're going to sit and listen. Oh. See, I was talking about how the weather comes in waves. So there's the next wave of rain. So at the moment, it's just a bit chilly, but barely a drop. And you can see that what Brian just showed you is going to come closer to us. So we're just standing by and listening. And we're listening for that very distinct sound of mating leopards. So while we sit quietly and listen, why don't we go see what Sam's up to? And hopefully when we be back, it'll be with the kitty cat. Well, it's been raining, everyone. As you can imagine, since I last saw you, Jandre and I have been listening through the block and trying to find our way towards the leopards, but then all of a sudden a shower came and we had to close up the camera and switch it off. And, and I don't know where I am, so I was very, very confused on what to do. Uh, but we managed to, to figure it out. And I, uh, from what I hear, I think Grant's uh, on his way to the leopards. So we're just gonna head towards camp, towards the area of camp, just and see what we can find. Because at the moment, uh, the rain is gonna cause a few issues, and it might, we don't wanna destroy any of the technical things on the vehicles. So 
with that, we're going to just carry on and see what we can find. Otherwise, let's have a quick conversation while, we, while Brent is out there looking for those, for those leopards. That's super exciting, eh? Imagine seeing mating leopards. It will be a first for me at, 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 uh, with Wild Earth TV. I've seen them before. It's got a really great question about um, the folklore around rain. Yes, that's. Thank you, Rebecca. This, this is. Uh, we're gonna head. Do you know where I used to live in the Cedarburg Mountains, just outside Cape Town? There, I was learning about the the way in which the the bushmen used to understand and have the relationship to the natural world, and rain was such an important thing. Imagine, you know, your country, wherever you are in the world, didn't have any rain, and you know you. You lived on the land. You didn't have showers and all these sort of things. So your relationship with water would be a lot, lot, lot stronger. So the Bushmen's relationship to to rain was incredible. When they felt or saw rain, it was a gift almost from the gods. And they used to, yeah, they used to praise the rain as it fell because that would, what would that create? It would create. Uh, the greener grasses, which would bring the herbivores in, which would bring the predators in. And so rain in, in most traditions around the world, in cultures that are still very uh, in touch with their indigenous side, will see rain as a very, very important and powerful thing in their lives. So both times since I've been back at uh, here on Wild Earth TV, I've seen it rain. I've only taken four drives, two interviews, and, and now this one, or yesterday and this morning, and it's rained twice, so I'm, I feel very, very, very excited. I can see John is also very excited that it's raining, not so much on his technical <laughs> his technical kit. But yeah, there's there's loads of um, loads of myths and that sort of thing around it. You're a fan from San, from San Francisco. <laughs> Sounds like a song. Anyway, yes, no, I didn't do a rain dance. I have to be honest, I did not do a rain dance last night. Um, I did think of it while I was lying in my bed. Last night I just heard all the elephants that were just outside our camp. Um, and I did think about a rain dance and how much fun that was. Um, so I didn't actually do one. Maybe. In, in the near future, when we, we don't have so much rain, I'll, I'll do a, a rain dance for you guys. <laughs> but strangely, I have the tendency to to, to stand on my... Ooh, hold on, we're going to link to Brent. See you later. There we go. We've caught up with them. Unfortunately, as we arrived, we could just hear them mating. And as we found her, they have stops but I'm sure they'll mate again soon. Yeah, let's try to get into a better position. Closer to us on the right, so she's looking particularly feisty this morning. Maybe it's just the weather. Around. I wonder if she's just lost sight of him. That's what she's looking for. Hasn't spotted him slightly to the south of her. There you go. She's going to go behind Taxon. And while she goes looking for Tingana, Mr. Tingana is next to Aubrey.
as she comes. And she's spotted him. It almost seems to be a slightly strange standoff happening at the moment. Here somewhere, and I see them both looking up and smelling around intently. Now, this is the area where I last had Karula's tracks as well. A day or two ago. Oh, here we go. Flirting starts. Growling starts. And the more I'm oh, hissing. Look at that. She's spitting at him, literally. how well her camouflage works as she lies down, disappears completely. Now, he's definitely smelt something, and he, he seems to be looking around. He seems to be checking in all the trees. Now, I wonder if Krula hasn't had a kill in this area in the last couple of days. We did lose her tracks somewhere close to here. when leopards mate, they don't do too much else. And Deanna's wondering, do they hunt? Well, must remember, they are opportunists, so it is possible that they hunt. But generally, while mating, they make a bit too much noise. Maybe Tindan is smelling Kula's scent mark. Maybe that's what he's sniffing at so intently. And that could be why Tandy's feeling uncomfortable. Ryan, can you see, he keeps looking into the trees. I can't see any signs of a carcass. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean there wasn't one there. But of course, a leopard's sense of smell is infinitely better than ours. He's definitely interested in something. Now, this cool, cool, windy, wet weather is actually quite a favorite for the big cats. They don't have to worry about overheating. And they can be very active on days and mornings like this. He's really, really interested in that, in something on that Marula tree. I think it's very st strongly possible that it's one of Karula's scent marks he's smelling if there wasn't a carcass around here. Now, this little bit of rain uh, has asked, caused Jim to wonder, oh, look at him, he's going up the tree. Maybe there, looks, maybe there was something up there, but I can't see anything. Sorry, but there we go. Look at that. Sniffy, sniff, sniff, sniff. Just this behavior makes me think that Kula has had a kill in this area. Uh, maybe not a scent mark. I think he's definitely in search of a free meal. And it might be finished already.
suit I had to put a carcass up that particular branch. I think that would be out of Mr. Tingana's range. Males are quite a lot bigger than the females and sometimes not quite as agile. Watch Tingana sniff, sniff, sniffing from up a tree. Uh, Jim Butler was wondering, do you, does the rain mask the scent of the predators? Not to the biggest degree, Jim. The thing with the rain does is it, it, it stops the sound and, and also, all of that jump, oh, right across. Very interested in something up that tree. But the wind and, and, and the rain will, will mask the presence and sound and movement of a predator much better. come down. Uh, Grant Rogers is, oh, here comes Tandy at the base. Growling and flirting at him up in the tree. She's going to go up. It looked like she was going to go up. Now, wouldn't that be something spectacular to see, a leopard mating in a tree? We saw Quatili, Quatile, quite a long time ago, try and mate with um, Uvula in a tree. But as you can imagine, it's probably quite a precarious thing, especially with the aggression of leopards mating. We're just going to try to get ourselves into a slightly better spot. She's going to jump right. There we go. Two leopards in a tree. Yeah, Tundi growling. She almost looks confused and he almost looks quite happy with himself that he's up there and she can't get to him. drag her tail underneath his nose and harass him. See, she's presenting to him. Oh, there we go. <laughs> interesting enough, as I said, it's going to be interesting to see if there's still the same amount of aggression, and there seems to be yeah, some post-coital snarling.
Shampoo and Vula seems convinced, I mean, not in Vula, Tingana seems convinced that there's meat in that tree. He's just been up. He keeps staring longingly at it. Now, Tandy's aggression could be the fact that the fact that Karula could be around here, or she has been around here recently. And she definitely doesn't look as comfortable as she was a few days ago. Now it is a flat. She's constantly listening and scanning. She might be a bit worried that the Karula might make an appearance. Now, it's not uncommon for a female leopard to trail mating pairs that are in their area. But maybe she's a little bit worried about her mother. Side of Mvula, but he does seem to be heading slightly more west. I mean, Tingana, why I keep calling him Mvula today? Tingana and Tandi, that's the party. Tingana and Tandi, that's the party. Tingana and Tandi, that's the party. I'm thinking, but welcome. Oh, she's going up. And again. So, There we go. I think we must have been a kill up there. Look at that. Ben, a huge welcome, who's a brand new viewer. Welcome. Ben's saying, I didn't. Why do they mate so quickly? So, Ben, they'll mate on average once every 15 minutes for four or five days. So it is very quick, very aggressive. Now, a male leopard's penis is barbed. So it actually hurts, and that causes that aggression. And oh, so that is that is why it is it is so quick. If it, it had to be anything prolonged, it would probably be too painful for the female to withstand. Now the barbs are there to help ensure insemination. So she's watching him. He's walking where we can't see, but I can. Definitely see she's very intently watching him. He's popped up next to us. I just didn't see him there. But uh, not the best view. He's moving through the thickets. So while we wait to see what plays out with this leopard scenario, let's go see what Sam's got. Well, in here now, guys, can you see the hyena? Wow, wow, that was amazing, guys. We, we were tracking our hyena just down one of the one of the dens, and we went to the more active den, and then we just came to to one of the older dens to see if there might be a hyena. And as we came down the road, you know, here he was, or she was, and can't really tell if it's a male or a female. I'll have a look now. I'm going to just switch off this vehicle and see if we can get a good. Ooh, she's just going. <laughs> There's another one coming through in the back there. You see? There's three. Wow. 
Wow, this is spectacular, everyone. Wow. We were just earlier looking for the, the leopards at Brentar now. I heard that's in a spectacular sighting, but hyenas are definitely one of my very, very favorite animals. It's because they're so, they're so curious. As you can see, this hyena is just walking around our vehicle. It's coming right down to the Wow, this is, this is amazing. Can you see the youngster? Chandra, oh, wow. So everyone, this is the spotted hyena. And it seems that this den might be becoming active. Because as I've been told, I, I mentioned earlier that this was actually an old den. And now, and now it seems to be active. But look, oh, this is amazing. When I was here just a couple of weeks ago, I was with the hyenas and we were with some very young ones. So I'm not sure, jean is this part of the same clan? Same clan. Same clan. And I remember one of the viewers, oh, hello. Whoa. Just came right up to my vehicle. I got a little bit of a fright there. But this is, oh man, this is just so cool. As I was saying, when I was last year, one of the viewers helped me understand who was who here and when they were born. And it was in November and December that they had, a, uh, had some cubs. So what we understand is... Oh. Hello, Michael, who is 13. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, that was something that baffled me when I first started guiding Michael was, was you know, is it, is it more related to a dog or a cat? And, and of course, we call hyena cubs. We call them cubs, so they're much more related to, to the cat family than they are to the dog, which hugely surprised me when I first came and started studying in the bush. So we call them cubs. You can also tell by their paw prints about the, from the tracks. You know, when I, you look at the tracks, sometimes you might think that they are that they are not um, they're not cats. I used to think I'd, because they have nails, so the type of animals that have nails in the front are also cheetah. Cheetah also have nails, so that can confirm something, can create a difference. Once you start to understand a little bit more about tracks and signs, you can start to understand the relation a little bit better between the species. Right here, the cub is, oh, this is incredible. I know that you guys have been having an exciting time. Oh, what do you guys think? It's so nice to just be quiet here with these hyenas and watch them. Hey? I think when, when it rains, when I was last year, we, I don't know if any of you guys were with me on that sighting, but we went, uh, we were just driving around and, and all of a sudden we came across two hyenas that were swimming in the rain and they were swimming in the water and that was just after the, after the rains. And so I think that they definitely enjoy water. And I mean, it's a bit of a coincidence that I come back the second time and, they're enjoying the rain or they're outside during the rain. And we said a little bit earlier when they might be in the den, but they're actually not, and they're walking around and they're being curious. And so it's interesting to see their behavior in this rain. It's, it's quite great. And as you can tell, like the bush has become so thick in vegetation since the start of the rains a couple of weeks ago. 
we've had something like over 200 mils of rain and it's had a big influence to, to the animals and the species of plants and, and of course that... Oh. So I keep getting distracted by these beautiful hyenas that are playing around us. What have you got there? As some of you would have learned through the other presenters that hyenas have a super interesting social structure. They actually have a, a, a matriarch that holds it. It's, it's the females that dominate the den. And it works in, in, in a, almost like a class system where the, 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 like the head female, and then you'll have the next subordinate female, and the males actually are below. But it can be very, it can be very difficult, you know, as you know, many many species in the natural world. Ooh, can you guys hear that? It's not often you get to hear that sound of the of the hyena. But I was just saying, it can be sometimes really difficult for for the, you know when you're a cub growing up, um, especially I think if you're a male cub, because you know you're the youngest and, and the, you know, actually. You, when you're a cub, they, the, the mothers will rear you the same. But as you grow, as they grow a little bit older, um, they start to fall into the class system a little bit more. So they're protected by the mother, mother when they're a cub. But as they grow a bit older, it gets a lot harder for them. And sometimes the uh, the one that is stronger and better will feed more and, and will become a lot stronger than the other one, and the other one will die. So it's, it can be a cruel world out there, but that's just the way it is, hey? the natural world, the way it works. But this is a very, very, very special sighting. It was so great. Myself and John Ray were just wondering, what should we do? And uh, you know, I really wanted to see the leopards. Um, but we decided to come and see, come and see the hyenas. It's really exciting to watch them play like this. This is the second time I've been able to just sit by the den and watch them play. But it's quite funny to watch this one with the thing in its mouth. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what it is. It seems like a, a bunch of almost it looks like it looks like pine needles, but obviously there's not much pine here, so. It, I'm not sure what, what do you think that is wrong there? What it has in its mouth. Oh, yeah. I wonder if he's using it for his pillow casing. Yeah, it looks like it's holding. I think my binocular. Huh? You say a hoof? Or a root. Yeah, it could be, a, it could be plant roots. Yeah, it looks like plant roots. I wonder what the hyena would be doing with plant roots other than just playing with it. Maybe it's gonna go and put it into its pillowcase and have a little pillow before it sleeps enough. But my more serious question, is it just for play? Hello. Looks like it's got the sleepy eyes. Much like me early this morning. Ah, <laughs> oh, sweet. So guys, this has been a great sighting with the, with the hyenas and they've been playing around us and giving me such a great time with them, especially around one of the older dens and I'm starting to lo learn this area and the ecology a bit, a bit better now. And I'm gonna sit here with the hyenas and I'm gonna send you back off to Brent's to see the leopards and see how they're doing. But so I hope that you guys are all enjoying the drive and I'll see you now.
think he's still up in the tree. I can't see Tingana, but I think he's behind us somewhere. Homie? He seems to have been moving away from her. And she hasn't come down the tree yet, so she might be able to see him from up there. You can see she's definitely very intently staring at something, which I'm pretty sure is Tingana. Look at that. She does have quite big eyes. Staring back towards where we think Tingan is gone. And look quite hungry. You can see that indentation just in front of her back leg. So they don't feed too often when they mate. I mean, they are opportunists, so something did sort of happen upon. But they are quite noisy when they're mating, so it makes it a little bit more difficult to catch anything. Oh, I was look at her. She's cleaning her her, her claws. Get me up. You're gonna move. She's gonna come down the tree. So, look at that. Such elegance, such poise, Brian. Big jump coming. Well, she's heading off in the direction we last saw. Tingana walking. So we're gonna move shortly. We just. Quite tightly jammed in at the moment. Mm, yeah, just gonna wait for tucks to reverse so we can move, because as you can see, we ain't going forward. There's a tree in the way. One 
useful thing about our vehicles is we are much shorter, so we can sort of zig and zag a lot easier. Line out that stump there. I'm going to miss it if I turn. see where she went, she disappeared behind all of us. It's definitely got a bit chilly at it when we started. Watch, watch, watch. Are you good, Brian? And while we try to get into position, uh, let's go jump on board with Sam. Welcome everyone back to the hyena den. Um, I'm sitting here. They've just gone over the mound and around the other side. So they were playing around my vehicle and me and Andre were having a good laugh as they're quite curious at, at times. And that, that thing in its mouth, that, you know, we didn't really know what it was, but it looked like it was a like piece of roots that they had got. We weren't quite sure what they were going to do with that. Um, but hopefully we can see them a bit later. And I just love watching them play. Uh, it's such an incredible thing that I've learned from hyenas. Well, with most, with most cats who are quite social, but you'll notice how how play is a very important part of their lifestyle and they learn everything from pouncing and feeding and all, that, all those important things they need to learn as they grow up, as they play. So it's always exciting to watch things move around. And I thought I would just uh, take this little device, well, sorry, not device, book out on the sp spotted hyena. Um, and there's two types of hyena that we get in, so in, in southern, Af southern Africa, the brown hyena, um, as you can see, is, is a lot harder to see in these areas. I've actually never seen a brown hyena. Um, but here, this one is a spotted hyena, otherwise known as Krokuta, Krokuta. So, yes, and, and <clears throat> as I showed you on my last drive, this is a device that you can put on, on the hyena and it actually starts making the hyena call. Uh, but I'm not gonna do that right now, as I don't think that that is a very ethical thing to do in the presence of the animal. So maybe a little bit later, we want, when you know, Michael is 13, I, I think you might really enjoy to hear the sound and we can get to know it a little bit better. Um, but I was just reading through everything here and, 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 and looking at the difference between the brown and the spotted. And I, lo I really look forward to seeing um, uh, the brown hyena. But noticing here that that red little dot means that they are near threatened, so that means that they are vulnerable and going through a difficult time. Uh, within conservation, it's difficult, and they they have a very important part of like important role within the ecosystem because they're actually territory consumers. They are the scavengers. They will go out and they will eat the carry on and uh, some of the old flesh that is left out in the bushfire. So they're actually the the hygienists of the bush. They're looking after all the hygiene, and, and, and that's very important, much like vultures. So vultures and, and hyenas play a crucial role, role within this ecosystem. But on that, we're going to link back to, to Brent, and we'll see you just now. Cheers. So it looks like we were correct. There was a kill around, and I'm pretty sure it was Karula's, and Tingana has managed to thieve it. It looks like a dike. So here we go, and that's what all that smelling was about. Uh, and he followed his nose right to a meal. Here we go. Uh, the reason it probably took him a bit longer to find it today 
is because of the swirling wind, so the scent wasn't coming from a particular direction, it was changing constantly. So male leopards frequently steal kills from the females within their home range and basically it works very similar to the way sort of male lions work in that if you're bigger you get to take what you want. It looks like this dike has been fed on for a bit before Mr. Tingana found it. And you probably find Krila might have stashed it and she's headed back to feed the cubs. And she's going to be a little bit sad when she comes back not to find any meat. And uh, uh, Tandi is wisely keeping her distance from Tingana while he's feeding. And she is just in front of us. But still quite far from him and not a very good visual from here. Now, he was looking quite hungry and in the mood for a meal, and that's exactly what he's managed to find. And even better, he's managed to find a freebie. Now, there's a possibility that Tandy might come try feed as well. Megan was wondering that. But uh, she will probably get uh, a stern warning from him if she does. Uh, with most predators, nothing is better than a free meal. And whether they can steal it from another predator or steal it from another species, they will. I'd say this is a relatively fresh kiln, probably yesterday. Hasn't got that lovely two-day-old carcass pong to it yet. So there's a strong possibility that Karula might return at some point during the day to this carcass. And uh, Rebecca in Final Control is wondering what would happen. Well, it's a very difficult thing to say. It all, all depends. Um, she might just stop at a distance and look. And female leopards, to a certain degree, will tolerate other female leopards in their territories while they're mating. But uh, if they're not mating, of course, there'll be a bit of a standoff. Now, she has a territorial boundary with Tandi to the south of us in Little Gauri, but she is also her daughter, so they tend not to physically fight too much. There's more sort of hissing and, and, and growling and scent marking and calling. But normally in this type of situation, she would probably stop her for distance, watch, and then move on.
So Sandra is wondering if Tandy ran into Karula, would she recognize their mother and daughter? Uh, it's a very difficult one to answer. I, I believe to a certain degree, but it by no means means that they're going to be friends or stop for a cup of tea. They'll be very aggressive towards each other, specifically on those territorial boundaries, or in this case, if Tandy is inside Karula's territory. And you might find Karula will be even more aggressive, especially because she does have cubs and another female leopard inside her home range is a, a, a big threat to those cubs. Yeah, you can see it is indeed a diker. What has he heard or seen or smelt? Could it be Karula on cue, arriving back at the scene? Or could there be a hyena on the way? False alarm. And he's definitely slightly perturbed about something. And it's not Tandy. Just trying to have a look into the bush beyond, but he seems to have settled again. Now he might try to fight off a single hyena. He's a magnificent specimen of male leopard. But if more than one arrives, I'm afraid the game is up for him. It is not warm at the moment. I'm very much regretting not bringing my big jacket or wearing long pants this morning. I think I'm going to have to take my, my, my blankie out. Oh, that's better. in search of the leopards when Tandy moved off. And Ak was wondering, was this killed in a tree or on the ground? Um, when we got here, it was on the ground, but that doesn't mean it wasn't in a tree. And it's very possible he might have taken it down from the tree to feed on the ground. So there's not any particularly large marula trees in this area. And he has a big male leopard, so it'd be very difficult for him to find a comfortable spot to feed in these trees that surround us at the moment. So it is possible he might have taken it to the ground once he, have, he found it. But we unfortunately did not see that. Uh, we only found him afterwards. And it's quite a small diker. He'll make quite short work of it. The interesting question to see is, will Tandy risk trying to flirt with him to mate while he is feeding? So Megan's saying she's never really seen a hyena in action. Would they attack Tingana for the food? Most definitely, Megan. Oh, here comes that very cold wind. Uh, they would definitely, they would charge in. You would see the tail come up in excitement. They might cackle a little bit and try to intimidate him. But I have seen him stand off with hyenas before. Uh, a female probably wouldn't even 
way to it immediately abandon the carcass. But a big male like this might throw a few punches, so to speak, a few swats of those massive paws. And as soon as the second hyena arrives, he's out, up the tree, out of the way. Okay, so we're gonna sit here in the cold. See, I'm under my blanket, holding my legs. Uh, while we do that and see what else happens at the leopards, Sam has got some botany to teach you. Here we are, out in the Sabi sands. Have a look at those clouds, everyone. Very ominous, and it's telling us that the rain is about to come down as we've just seen a little bit earlier it was raining quite heavily on us and we were having some difficulty um, but you can really I really want to try and bring the viewers into this experience the winds blowing so what does the wind do it's it makes all the impala quite skittish every single time we've driven close to an impala or nyala that just ran straight away from us so it's interesting to see how wind can create a difference in the bush fouts because also it's difficult for them to smell so you can imagine what it's like to be an antelope archer uh, but the wind is coming from a northerly direction uh, the rain has been nice and uh, been a drizzle to, a little, to, to, to quite a few big drops um, so that that's a little bit of the atmospheric conditions that I'm feeling at the moment and hopefully that can help you feel at the same time um, we were just with the hyenas. It was an exciting little adventure around the, the termite mound there. Uh, you know, John and I had no idea that that was actually going to be active, and it was active to our surprise. So that's exciting for us. And you're probably seeing me hold a book here. This is my my favorite favorite book, uh, my bedtime story book. It's called The Heart of the Hunter by Lawrence van der Post, and it is just riddled with some of the African stories that the Bushmen used to have. Um, it's very difficult to discern whether all, like, all these stories are completely true and that's exactly the way in which they framed it. But, you know, what I found really, really interesting is when I, I, I did a story yesterday on the hippo and understanding the way in which the hippo is connected to the water and how it became um, a water animal rather than a land animal. And um, this book is, is a whole bunch of stories that the Bushmans collected over time to understand their environment. They understood, their, they understood nature through storytelling. And this book has given me many, many, many bedtime stories. Um, so over our course of the time, hopefully together we're going to grow in stories, we're going to grow in knowledge, we're going to grow in experiences, we're going to have a lot of fun. But at the same time, I'm going to bring you to one of the first plants that I ever experienced here in the Sabi Sands. Have you got good visual there, Jean-Ré? The name of this plant, from what I understand, is called the Blue Commonelia. The Blue Commonelia, and you'll see it littered around the bush. There's quite a few of them um, that I've seen lately, and you also get a yellow Commonelia. Uh, which I think are a little bit more difficult to find. But the story that goes behind this plant is really interesting. Um, for, from, from what I heard that the, the story was something to do with the three brothers. Um, if you look closely, it actually has three petals. One, two, and the third one is over here. But it's a little bit shorter, as you can see. Um, and it's something to do with the three brothers. So. When I get back to, to camp this evening, I'm going to go read up on my knowledge of the blue commonelia and the stories that go behind the name. And I'll come back to you and we'll have another look at a blue commonelia in the future. But that for me is exciting to see another fam fam familiar face of the bush felt, as I haven't been here for a long time. So it's, it's all very exciting. And sorry if I sound quite congested. This weather is, has changed my my nasal, my nasal paths. Just gonna get connected and we can carry on our drive. All right, we've got some wind blowing over here and I'm struggling to find my cord. All 
on the back. Sorry about that, everyone. I'm still trying to understand how I fit everything in here. Cool. We are back. We are going to be linking through this to back to Brent, and we're going to continue back towards and see if we can find us an elephant. But enjoy Brent, and I'll see you just now. Not much changed here. Tangana still munching away on that darker carcass. You can hear those small bones breaking as he chews through the edge of the rib cage. And he's still lying about 20 meters away. Lion and I shivering in the cold wind. And see, I'm sure you guys can hear, but the wind is seriously whipping around today. And then look at the trees. Uh, just off to the right, I don't know if we can see it nicely, but there we go. Tandy is hiding over there somewhere. There. Not even looking at the carcass. <laughs> looking the other way, but not to be tempted. So for a big animal like Tingana, Dike is a relatively small meal, but it should hold him for a day or two. Oh, look at that wind. Whacking the panicum grass around. So there's a chance um, there's another vehicle on their way. So we will stay a little bit longer and then we'll probably make space for them uh, to come have a look. And I think maybe, should we go look for some lions next, Brian? Mm. I think we can find some lions, make it a double cat morning. Okay. He's keen. Oh, what's he looking at? What's he heard? Well, we're having a bit of a cat streak, the second one in, in the last while, and James Richard would like to know, what day are we on our cat streak? Oh, yeah. When did James start driving? What day? He's <laughs> not very confident about that, Brian. <laughs> when did you start driving? 31st. 31st. Afternoon. But that was the day we didn't have any cats. No, I, I came back to Lions and Leopards on my first drive. Ah, then it was the day before. Now, it sounds like we're on day five. I'll have to double check that. Day five, big cats. And of course, the, the, the grand prize, the, the holy grail, is to try to break the streak we had last year of 29 days on the trot with big cats. Now, I think the best chance for this to break the 29-day streak is going to be in the winter. Hopefully, we'll have some awesome viewing during the dry season. Also, it's just a little bit easier to track them during the dry season than it is at the moment.
And so guys, we're going to cap one last look cap, and then we're going to make space for another vehicle who's coming in, and we're going to head on and see what else we can find on this very windy and chilly morning. I'm leaving Taxon and Orbs with uh, Tingana and Tandi. Uh, Johan making his way. Bye bye, kitties. We'll see you later. We might try to sneak back in here a little bit later, uh, depending on vehicle movements and whatnot. We're going to try and sneak our way through here. There's one last view of Tandy, the loved one. There she is. Looking very upset that her love life has been interrupted by a meal. So she's going to have a snooze. Okay. Bye-bye, madam. Now we're going to try to find our way out of this bucket. Sometimes easier said than done. So while we do that, let's jump back on board with Sam. Oh, hole. Here we are, guys. I'm just gonna keep my voice down as I know that these impala are extremely skittish at the moment. You see the bird over there? I think I think that's a, those are some hornbills. We saw the hornbills a bit earlier. Sorry, I just, I know that for my viewers, we're doing a bird list, but we saw uh, the red hornbill yesterday. Um, and we'll see if we can find the yellow one. But at the moment, let's have a look. Can you guys see those two male impala that are clashing horns together? So as I said earlier, that it's, it's been, the wind makes them very, very skittish. So I'm actually at quite a distance at the moment. So we're just watching them. Yeah, from, from far away. And you can see the two males that are bumping horns against each other there. Wow. Now, this is a, a really, really special time to be in the bush when it comes to impala. As I'm sure you guys know, that impala are extremely, extremely efficient and they've done so well uh, over, over thousands of thousands of years to, to be here. And, and they've just their way of life, their structure, their social structure is very efficient. Even their breeding, their breeding habits, and you know, having the breeding time in November, when the best rain, time for rainfall, um, they're just a very clever design, uh, the impala. And just while we're sitting with them, this is otherwise known as a, a bachelor herd. So you'll see that every single impala out there actually has horns, from what I can see from the distance. But what's interesting about this time of year is otherwise known as the rutting season so the rutting season starts between april and may and you'll start to see as you drive around the swabi sands many of the males clashing hordes and fighting and this is to to prep them to get them stronger and uh, to get their you know their dominance a little bit bigger in their in their you know, in their bachelor herds and and soon after the, the bachelor herds, it then goes to, ooh, we've got a Crested Franklin that just jumped past the road here. Hello, Crested Franklin. We've seen the Crested Franklin. I think he's just gone into the thicket there. Can you see him? Oh, there he is. Sweet. You can tell it's a Crested Franklin because of that white little strip above, it, above its eye. Also, as I said yesterday, it has a very remarkable alarm call. But let's just go back to, to the Impala. You know, oh, there's zebras. You see the zebras? Wow. I have not seen that before. I have never seen that before. What is going on? What is going on? 
So that's a first time view, everyone, for me to see zebra in parlor in one scene. This is incredible, classic bushveld sight to watch more than one animal in, in the picture. You know, often, also during these windy times, you'll, you'll often find that, that the herbivores come into the open areas to, to protect themselves a bit better. They can't hear the predators in the thick bushveld out here. So they come in their numbers, they come together, and, and that, you know, that just means more eyes out there that, that help them protect in this windy, time but let's just stick on these beautiful looking zebra let's have a look and see what they're doing i used to tell zebra by, by understanding whether it was a male or a female by this the strip of black at the back um, but from this distance i can't quite tell you know which is which do you know genre? They're both males. I think they're both males. But it's you know, we've we've seen some great interactions this morning. Hey, with the hyena, hyenas had a social interaction with lions yesterday, and now we're sitting with the with the zebra. You know, very very social together. And you can those remarkable stripes, the black and white stripes. Yeah. I used to think, wow, I can easily see you out in the bush felt with those black and white stripes. But it's actually a very interesting you know, adaption to the environment. It helps, helps them when they, you know, of course they call it dazzle when there's more than one. So this is actually, we have a dazzle of ze zebra over here. With the, with the, ooh, the wind's really starting to blow everyone. It's quite, quite remarkable actually. As I was saying, uh, zebra are ex extremely interesting. They're, it's like disruptive. So when they're running in the, away from a predator, it's much difficult for the predator to catch them with that coloration that they have. Um, so it's very, very important adaption for them. But I've had some amazing experiences with, with zebra on foot where I once was just sitting out on a pan and a whole dazzle of, of zebra just walked past me and, and I was just watching and looking at them and looking at their manes and they really are remarkable creatures. Uh, my sister used to have a horse and I used to really enjoy watching the horses and, and so uh, to now be with some zebra out in the bush felts is, is, is great. And this interaction is remarkable. I hope you guys are all enjoying this. It's, it's great to watch. All right, guys, I'm gonna see if I can get a little bit closer to the zebra. Remember, it's going quite quietly as it's quite windy and they're all gonna be quite skittish of us. So it's important for us to be very aware of what is going on. We can see a starling over there. That's something that we can uh, add to our list. So Andre is going to get a close up. Three types of starlings in the area. But we'll see if we can get a bit closer. Birchels, the Birchels starling, Cape Glossy eyed starling, and the Greater Blue Eared. Not quite sure which one it is. We know it's a Cape if it's got a yellow eye. I can't quite see at the moment. The virtual starling is much bigger. My guess is that it's either Cape Glossy Eye, the Greater Blue Eared. But I just want to get closer to these zebra because they're an amazing sighting. We've got some hornbills. All the birds are coming out, guys. I just want to, I really want to go and watch these zebra. They're really, really fascinating me. Can you see how these impala are? If you have a look, they're just staring at me. I'm gonna go very, very slowly. Hi, Megan, yes. Uh, that's what I was really quite interested in, is they did look quite painful. And I'm not quite sure the, why they were doing it. It's fascinating behavior. So I'm just gonna sneak, sneak into the zebras here 
And here we go. Let's watch them. I'm going to switch off. You can notice that they're very, very aware of us at the moment. So I'm going to keep my voice down as much as possible. I hope that you can hear me out there. Please, Rebecca, let me know if, if it's too soft. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm apparently loud and clear. But look at this, these remarkable animals here. See the tail flicking from side to side. That's often to do with flies that often irritate them. You see their bodies shaking like that. It's awesome. There's a bird on them. Did it just fly off? It have been the ox pecker. It was the ox pecker. Amazing, guys. So we've seen a starling and we've seen an ox pecker this morning. But sitting with these zebras, it's really, really quite interesting. You can see that they're quite young. Stallions. As I said a bit earlier, you'll often find the zebra and the impala and giraffes that will be in these big open areas. Yeah. Yana just asked if this is um, dominant male behavior. And quite what we've been seeing with the impala and they're you know ca clashing with the horns here in the bachelor the bachelor herd i think it, it must it, it might be a very similar behavior but between two males um to to quite to develop their dominance and and as i said earlier it's the same with hyenas and many other animals of the bushes that they will play with each other to to get stronger, to develop the claws that they need, and to and to grow into a stronger, more majestic animal. So my my prediction is that these are two males that are exerting some dominance with each other to try and help grow and foster their developments into the future. But it's oh man, it's so cool to look at that dazzle and look at the two black, two black and white stripes, white with black stripes or Black with white stripes, I'm not quite sure. But as you can see, they're feeding. Um, what's, what's really quite interesting with, with wildebeest and, and zebra. Sorry, just, we're just going to Megan's qu uh, question quickly. It's the interesting line patterns on the top of the right zebra. I see what you're saying there, Megan. I, also, I can also see that. That really is quite remarkable. Different coloration of brown and black and white. And then it's, it's quite squiggly on the back legs. Wow. That is really interesting, eh, Meg? But I was, what I was just saying a little bit earlier, just going back to that, the way in which, um, you know, you, you get successive grazing. So successive grazing means that animals within that in the ecosystem are all going to eat much different, much differently. And uh, they'll basically, like wildebeest like to eat the much shorter grass and the, the zebra like to eat the longer grass. So it's actually really good for an ecosystem when you have grazers that are, that are eating the different lengths of grass because it helps the development of the grass and it helps with the nutrition and you know fostering more seed dispersal around the area to create a more diverse resilient ecosystem so it's great to watch all these all these animals and understand the way in which their eating behaviors are and their social behavior and that's all that we're seeing here you can see that the zebra now are, are starting to eat asked a very, very interesting question. And it, sta it states that the, the impala are 
We're going to quickly, Jean-Ray, can you, do you mind just going and having a look at one of, one of the Impala just in front of us? Aqua was asking, you know, from a biomimicry perspective, which just to, to tell the viewers what biomimicry is, biomimicry is basically understanding, you know, the natural world and the genius of the natural world. Everything has been here for over 3.8 billion years. And so over time, um, plants, animals have, have adapted to their landscapes in order to thrive and survive. So biomimicry is essentially learning from the ecosystem or from a specific plant or organism and applying it to a human systems to make our systems more efficient. A very quick example that I'll make is with a sunflower or, or with any type of tree. How is a tree fostering its energy from the sun by collecting different aspects of the sun um, to, to absorb absorb energy normally our solar panels if you have a solar panel on top of your of your roof aqua you'll notice that it'll just take in one aspect whereas the natural world is taking in many many different aspects so that that is going to create an efficiency of sunlight and obviously that'll help with more energy so just taking biomimicry to the level of the impala i'm so this is this is Generally, genuinely what gets me so excited about being out in the bush felt and applying the knowledge that I've learned over my degrees and, and studying biomimicry is, is looking at this. And I mean, if we look at the adaption of the Impala to its landscape, you can see the way in which it has a different coloration between the bottom of the Impala and the top. And that actually helps them blend into this environment a little bit better. So from a, from a point of view of blending things in, we can learn how animals like the impala are blending themselves into the environment um, to make them, you know, from a survival technique, that's really important. But if you're going through to, to any other design aspects, I mean, we can look at anything from the horns um, to the way in which the ears move to collect sound, to understand how, how they work in, in their ecosystem. I mean, aqua, it's, it's, it's a very interesting question because you, you, with biomimicry, you don't have to only go to the actual design aspect. You can go into the behavior act aspect and how they are working as a social organization, how they are efficient in their social organization, which can be learned within business even. How could businesses even learn to, to, to adopt strategies that Impala have that, are, that help them to become more efficient as, an, as a species out in the wilderness. These sorts of um, theories and, and questions are, are becoming more relevant um, in our time because, as, we, as I said a little bit earlier, the natural world has been here for a lot longer than us. And that's what really inspires me and gets me up every morning is, is I want to, you know, my biggest mentor in life is, is the natural world. And so it's incredible. So thanks so much for allowing me to talk about that. Um, we're going to go back to Brent and see how Brent's doing out there. In the meanwhile, I'm going to continue on this road. Thank you all for that great sighting with the zebra um, and the impala, and we'll have some more discussions a bit later. Cheers for now. Welcome back to the shivering vehicle. We are shivering in search of a the Inkahuma Pride, we checked their last position from last night. Looks like their tracks go north into the block. So we're going to do a loop around here. So not only are we shivering in anticipation of finding lions, we're actually shivering from the cold this morning. Brian uh, got it a bit worse than I did. Um, sliding around, he got a wet bottom, which is, of course, very uncomfortable. But he's a tough guy. He'll survive. Me, I wouldn't survive. I'd be most unpleasant. I really don't like being cold. Just checking carefully. The only tracks we've seen along here is a herd of wildebeest came strolling down and some buffalo bulls. Now, I'm not sure, because I was very fast asleep. We had quite a long day yesterday, traveling up mountains and whatnot. So I'm not sure when this weather set in last night. It was, the stars were still out when I went to bed. So it could have been a very successful night of hunting for the Inkuma Pride if it was dark and windy. So those are the best nights for the cats in terms of hunting.
So while we're in search of lions, let's chat about another pride we actually saw for a, a few days called the Talala Pride. Now, they came up here during the upheaval that was the uh, coalition takeover of the Birmingham boys. And what happened was, the Birmingham's pushed the Matimba males down to the south, and that caused a lot of lions to pop up in places they're not normally seen. And one of those was the Salala Pride, and Christopher is wondering if anyone knows the location of the Salala Pride. Christopher, I'm quite sure there's somewhere uh, down around the Sand River, which is their normal home range. And it was quite unusual for us to have them where we did all the way up here in the north. They sometimes come to the northern boundary of Rondelosi and the northern Sabi Sands, uh, but it is uncommon. So probably we're probably not going to see them too frequently. So the two main prides, the three main prides in the north are the Nkahumas, who we're searching for now, uh, the sticks, and then further to the north in Brussels, the Talamites. And very occasionally, the Mangen, or which is the Tsalala breakaways, or the Tsalalas will, will come in, but not really hang around too much. Now, the Inkahumas really favor this block here. We've, we've had them in there many times, and we've actually watched them hunt in there a few times. But it is also quite a challenging block in terms of monkey orange thickets. But we are hoping that they haven't crossed over this road we're driving on at the moment because this is uh, our, the northern edge of our traverse. So we're just doing a big loop, a slow loop, checking for tracks around. Thank you to Marianne and many others. It would be quite wonderful. They said they're sending us a virtual uh, cup of hot chocolate. Uh, unfortunately, that would be very, very pleasant. Ooh, what's been going on here? I think it is elephants, but let's just, yes, it's elephants. Elephants, you can see all the tracks, broken branches on the road. Now, what we would do for a virtual, or for a non-virtual cup of hot chocolate, Brian, what would you do? Um, I would sing a song very loudly. You would sing a song very loudly. Mm. Should we try and make James get out of bed and bring us up? Well, that probably wouldn't go down well. I think we should try anyways. I think should we should try anyways, yes. Um, maybe we should ask James if he can come out with a, with a nice flask of hot chocolate for us. Serenade him with the song. Yes, yes. Brian will serenade him. I will, I will, I will sit meekly because if I start singing or serenading, um, well, there will be no serenading. There will be much gnawing and gnashing of teeth and, and scraping of fingernails across blackboards because that's probably the closest description to my singing voice I can come up with. Wailing and gnashing of teeth, I actually think, is the phrase. Like a banshee. Like a banshee, yes. Chris Rogue is on form, said from the killer bees to the chiller bees today. Yes, we're definitely chilly bees today. Hello. What is going on here? No. Yeah. It, it is the hyenas. Now the Inkahumas and Karula are two, two animals here that have mastered the art of flying across roads. We're not sure how but they definitely managed to fly at some point, leaving their tracks a complete mystery.
of course, is one of my favorite things to do. And tracking big cats is especially one of my favorite things to do. And a lot of you are wondering, is it difficult to... Oh, they're going to my hat. Speaking of the wind track in this wind, uh, tracking itself is not so bad. Uh, if we actually walk tracking, it is a little bit more difficult. You just got to be a lot more careful uh, when you're walking because this wind is so constantly shifting and changing direction so you, you, you can surprise an animal. And it's generally not the lion so much that you're worried about in this wind. It is one of those beasties. And particularly, I think that one, he just looks morbid. And now, in this strong wind like that, these guys are going to be particularly jumpy because, of course, it is great weather for the lions. And you can see, just listening to our voice, he's not sure what's on. And he, there we go, he's figured out where we are. And uh, on foot, sometimes you, you don't <laughs> hear them as easily because often you find buffalo by hearing them. But in this wind, they're going to be bedded down, not moving, and quite often in some thick areas. So it is. It is a little bit more dangerous to track in the wind. But that makes it a little bit more exciting, gets that heart rate up. Now also the wind, what the wind does affect in tracking is uh, sometimes it can be very difficult to age track, especially on a busy road, because the wind can blow those edges so it looks like the tracks might be older than they are. But that slight little bit of rain we had this morning, if there's any tracks moving around above that, it will be very easy to see. But the ones below it, with the wind and rain, are going to be more difficult to see. Now, for example, I think this is probably from yesterday morning, but you can barely see the track with a little bit of drizzle on it and the rain and vehicles. You see it, Brian? You see the one that. There, where? On the edge there, I think. There. Now that is Karula's tracks. And you can see how there's no defined edges. Uh, the wind has blown those and it's got that fine layer of drizzle on. So it can actually make tracks quite difficult to see. The other thing is obviously light. Uh, especially the best time for tracking is in the early morning, late afternoon. So when the, the angle of the sun actually throws a shadow on the track. So of course, tracking in this, you're not seeing any shadows. So it does make it a little bit more difficult. But it's a good thing. We like a challenge. New viewer, great to have you on board, Austin, who's in Derbyshire. Oh, Derbyshire, it sounds very fancy. Um, Austin would like to know, what the heck isn't in Kahuma? Well, Austin in Kahuma is actually a brown ivory tree, so we're tracking a tree at the moment. Um, it is a very big, beautiful tree, but it does been known to move occasionally. No, Austin, I'm only joking. The Inkahuma is actually a brown, a brown ivory tree, but it is the name given to the pride of lions we see most often. So the first time they were found was by the Juma guides, and they were sleeping under a brown ivory tree, and that's how they, the pride got its name, the Inkahuma pride, the brown ivory pride. While we continue to look for these lion tracks, or should I say shiver for these lion tracks, uh, let's uh, jump back on with Sam, who's in an area that's got a lot of general game. Here we are, everyone, by a collective noun. So if I know what the collective noun is for a group of giraffe. If, you're, if you want to tell me what it is, please can you email Safari Live or Twitter and hashtag Safari Live. What do you think of the collective noun of giraffe is? But here, yeah, this is a spectacular, spectacular sighting. You know, earlier I said that this was a bushfire sighting when we were sitting with some impala and some zebra. 
now we are stand well, we are in the car with not only giraffe but now you can see some impala and just to the left of us we can see some zebra just like we saw a little bit earlier so it's the zebra over there and we can see some water buck we can tell that they are water buck because of the big circles are up there above, but you can't see that right now i'll bring that back up when i think one of them will stand but there are some impressive looking horns out there as well if uh, can you see those genre just your, yeah, yeah there we go look at those beautiful male horns there very very dominant male just sitting by the watering hole so this is a classic scene from the bush felt where you know as i said earlier you'll often find that they'll come into the open areas it's, just, it's much safer during the, the times of wind and you can just see them all clumped here together protecting using the the bush felt and and using having the eyes with the giraffe if we could just move towards the giraffes over there you can see that they're eating and they've got their eyes are very high high up so i'm sure the other animals are extremely grateful to the giraffe as they have their eyes looking around the bush felt for them I have to see if they have any predators and and you can see they're all feeding there there's a sweet little youngster oh man I think this is also a first for me with giraffes and safari live. Incredible, incredible creatures. Definitely one of my favorites. The design of the giraffe is, is incredible. And everything from a biomimicry point of view, understanding the way in which giraffes are, their, their necks, the way their tongues are, uh, are incredible. Just from the, the, the saliva that they have, in, uh, that giraffes have, are, are very interesting. As, as a lubricant, they've actually uh, mimicked the, the way in which the saliva of the giraffe uh, within mechanics uh, as a salivation because they've got such such very very uh, yeah very very liquidy or what's the what's the word when for mechan mechanized things I've just gone blank viscous what's that viscous viscous yeah yeah I've, I've just gone blank I'll come back to that but yeah you can see some ox pickers on the giraffe and you know, what's so incredible about a giraffe, if, if you can, genre, if you can go close up to, the, to its mouth, if you can, if you can go a bit closer, you, if you can see their tongue, you can notice that the tongue is very, very dark and almost looks very black. And, and this is interesting because what giraffes will do is they will wrap their tongue around the bush or around a twig and then they'll pull with their tongue, even if it's an acacia, and pull all the leaves off. Can you guys just imagine for a second using your tongue around an acacia plant? I'll show you an acacia plant a little bit later. It's very, very thorny, so it, it, it looks like it would be very painful. But what they actually do is they have um, their blood vessels are very, yes. Sorry, Robin, thank you, Kirst and John and Mike. It is a journey of giraffe. Thank you very much for, for bringing that up. But just going back to, to the tongue of a, a giraffe, you'll, you'll find that they're black because their blood vessels are deep, deep inside of the tongue so that when, they, they, when the thorns go through, they actually don't create uh, bleeding. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a very, very, very interesting adaption that the, that the giraffe have created. And they one of the, if not the largest mammal on the planet, and look at them uh, you can tell that they they're females and males by by looking at the ossicles on top of their head and if the ossicles are quite furry we can tell that they are females and if they're not if they look like they don't have the fur on top of the ossicle on top there then it is a male and the the reason why they have is for the males the females don't really use those little horns on top of their head which you can just see behind the plants there uh, is, 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 is for fighting, you know, they, they use it uh, in dominance and um, you'll start seeing, like, it's incredible to watch when you see two giraffes um, having a fight, or not a fight, just doing some dominance um, and they'll swing their necks and, and hit, hit the other giraffe with their ossicles. It's, it's an extremely interesting behavior to watch and it looks quite painful, generally, very, very, very painful. But as, as you'll notice, sometimes with giraffe, which is, you know, as you can see, it's, it's a female with a youngster there. 
and and often with with a with a, a female and its youngster, the the mother will actually go out into the into the bush away from the youngster sometimes because as you can see, they can be seen from a long way away, and it can actually draw in the predators when you see the large mother walking around. But just have a look at this huge giraffe coming in here. Wow, that is a big giraffe. Oh, Chica, he has to bend down to get some to get some of the plant material. I want you a very large chap. Yeah, Mac, there is a very, very significant size difference between all those giraffes. And as our friends a little bit earlier told us that it is a journey of giraffes, I'm actually not quite sure why they call it a journey. Maybe it's, I don't, I just know it's a journey. I wouldn't be able to tell you why it's called a journey. Um, maybe they, they go on long distance travels together. But wow, it's incredible to look at the size of that one. It's, it's significant. And you know, often you can tell the difference between a male and a female through the coloration of, of, of a female and a male. The males can be much, much darker than the females. Um, so we can see the one, the tall one that just came in is a very, very significant looking male. And you can also tell by his horns that he doesn't have much fur there. So that is definitely a male. And it's an incredible sighting to watch at the same time, um, a journey of giraffe or drinking. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen that uh, before. It's, it's amazing how they have to like push their whole leg. You see those legs, those dwindly legs, and to get their head down to the water, uh, they have to spread their legs out and then they, they drop their head down towards the watering hole to drink. And it's, it's, you know, it's exceptionally hard. And can you imagine the amount of blood flow that has to, you know, that goes down towards the head when they, went, when they go down for a sip of water. Um, so they've actually got a very, very interesting adaption to that where they have um, almost like it, it fills up with blood just at the back of their head. So when, I've forgotten the name of it. Um, so if anyone knows the name of it, please hashtag Safari Live and tweet it in what the name of the, almost like a, it's almost like a, what do you call it? a sponge at the back of the head that will soak up all the blood um, while it's drinking the water because if you can imagine it would make us pop but we're just going to move ahead quickly just because we have a vehicle just ahead of us so i'm just going to get off road quickly the Sabi Sands. You can see that the clouds are still very significant in the sky there, which gave us a good little drizzle a little bit earlier. But genre, if we can just go back towards the watering hole and just see what we've got going um, in this mix, the big mix. While we're doing that, I'm just going to quickly write in my book one of the birds we just saw where we had now, which was the barn swallow. I'm just going to write that down quickly to our list. Uh, over here. Ooh, there we go. Barn swallow. Awesome, guys. Our bird list is ticking on. I'm up, up to five birds now in the bush vault. I'm just going back towards these zebra. You can see the dam is looking full. When I was last year, I told you it, it was very, very old. The watering hole was very, very, um, it was very dry. And to see the water coming up is, is, is great news for the bush vault. The animals are going to take in this green, green, lush grass that's around it and drink some 
good water before the dry winter comes. The winter is in the winter months here in the Sabi Sands, so they're probably going to be taking in as much nutrition with this rainfall as they can. Sign significantly more green air here. So I can just feel that these zebra are taking full advantage of this green pasture, basically, out here. And in the distance there, you can see those nests. Can you see those nests in the distance there, everyone? Those are, if I'm, you know, if I'm wrong, I'm pretty sure that they are red-billed buffalo weaver nests. So, I think from this distance, that, that is a very difficult thing to see, um, if there is a red-billed buffalo weaver over there. And so we're not going we, to off-road at all, um, as it's, it's for birds. Uh, so we're just gonna, we'll have to see the red-billed buffalo weaver at a later stage. But, yeah, they, they also are really, what's that just behind there? Is that a hippo? I think it's water buck. Oh, uh, wait, so I'm sorry, it's a water buck. In the distance there, I thought that that was a hippo going into the water there, which would have been quite exciting. But look at that target. Can you guys see that perfectly round, on the back of the water buck. That is a, a significant way in which you can tell that that is a water buck from the back. Um, and some, some people have you know, many different theories around why that there is a circle on the, on the bum. Um, the most common theory is that it's, it, it's to help with the youngsters to follow each other. It's almost like a signal, much like the uh, warthog, which ha sticks up its tail to help the young piglets follow the warthog. It's much the same with the with a water buck that, that helps them uh, follow each other when they are running through the bush felt, potentially running away from predators. It helps the youngsters stick with the mother when they are out there. So this has been a spectacular sighting, guys. Um, you know, to be back out here in the Sabi Sands, the winds are blowing. I wish you could all feel the wind blowing while I look over the savannah with the barn swallows just slowly eating on some of the insects and the zebra that have been giving us some extremely interesting activity to the impala that were rutting earlier, the males with their big males that are coming in into their bachelor herds. It's all, it's all going down here in the bush part. But with that, I'm gonna carry on and let's not forget the beautiful giraffe, which have been a spectacular sighting this morning. I'm just gonna get back onto the road. Over here, Jean-Marie, can you see the starling that's on this piece of wood? All right, so that's definitely a starling. You can tell that that's a starling because of the... Yeah, you can tell that those are starlings because of the iridescence um, on them. But we can quite clearly see that there's no yellow eye on that starling. So that's going to tell us that it's not a... Oh, hold on. Is there a yellow eye there? No. So we quite, can quite clearly see that that is not. Ooh. I'm just going to get my bird book out. And we're going to have a look at the different starlings. And we can work it out together. Um, I haven't been with starlings for quite some time. So it's just be important for me to, to have a look Starling. Two seven six. Two seven six. Oh, the virtual starling. So you can quite significantly see if you come towards that book, towards the book here. Thanks, Chandra. In a number of different starlings. Um, this is a. This is the virtual starling, which is a much bigger starling than the other ones. And you have the Cape Glossy starling and the Greater Blue-Eared starling. So I'm going to say that that is a virtual starling because there is no coloration in the eye between those two that I noticed. Did you notice that, Chandra? Right, so we can write that onto our list. This is all very exciting. I'm going to write that on my list right now. And 
one thing that I want to just bring you guys back to. I don't know if, if you guys were on my interview drives. Oh, watch them play. That's great. Guys, I must say that we've really had some cool sightings this morning. You know, I was nervous again coming out on drive. Great shot, John Ray. Amazing shots there. Um, but this device, um, I, can't, I don't know if any of you guys were there when I introduced you to it, but it makes the sound of the, of the, the bird that we just saw. And this is what's going to make it so exciting for us to learn out here in the bushfire, because not only are we going to learn the names of the birds, but you can actually learn the sound, the bird call, and have a bit more of a holistic experience to understanding the birds out in the savannah. So that is quite clearly not a... a a virtual starling that was a African fish eagle. That is something that, I, that we've always going to be quite aware of, is to, to, to not play the sound calls when you're too, too close to the, to the birds, because it can be quite distracting for the birds. And from an ethical point of view, it's not very good. So I think I might have been a little bit too close doing that for the birds. I'm going to try and keep a distance every single time I do that. But it is in, in, incredibly interesting to, to listen to the sound of the bird while, while looking at them at the same time. So with that, we're going to be linking back to Brent. Thanks, everyone. It's been a very ex exceptional sighting, Archer. See you now. Hello. The Inkahumas have flown. We're not sure where. They've taken off. Um, I can't find any tracks. I saw one track sort of going north into that block. Nothing coming out. But then also we saw quite a lot of animals just lying around in that block. There have been some big herds of ellies around that might have obliterated tracks. And speaking of big ellies, we're in search of the naughty elephant. Uh, I saw him this morning just outside the camp, on this big hole in his ear. And maybe he's moved out onto the vast open plain of quarantine. And uh, he's been here. There's sign, broken branches, big footprints. We're on the right trail. I wonder if he's still in must. I don't think so. And I had a quick look at him as we drove past this morning in the darkness. Didn't notice too much wetness around his legs. I wonder where he's gone. He's quite big, so hard to miss out in the open. Now, there you go. Hello, birds. Oh, goodbye, birds. <laughs> flock of red-billed buffalo weavers. Now, they're probably the tech department's least favorite bird. They are fantastic builders, and they build impressive communal nests out of big thorns and sticks. And that provides the tech department with some challenges when they decide to climb a tower like that one. Now, that is one of our towers, and have a look. That is a mass of thorns that has been put there by the buffalo weavers. So, of course, tech department's not a big fan of them. So, we removed the nests outside of breeding season. Uh, oh, sorry, one second. Standing by.
Coffee and Thanks Clubs. Uh, it's Aubrey's Road, uh, just off the fire break um, from Bubbles of Cutline. You'll see the tracks, it's very distinct. So there's two sets of tracks that go off Aubrey's Road. It's the one furthest to the north. Sorry, just letting Corvus know that where the hyena den is. And uh, as we say, yes, so we removed those nests during the non-breeding season, but they literally put them back as fast as you can take them out. So very, very amusing for, for us not in the tech department. Oh, and look at those poor, poor shivering impalas. They, they look how I feel at the moment. Oh, the wind's getting stronger. Now, there's one who is particularly cold. I think if I was an, uh, an impala and well, it's a female, that, that would be me. Now, you just see how red she is compared to the rest. She's extended her, her fur up as much as possible and trying to get that insulative blanket of warm air around her. You can see a lot of their tails are swishing, and Megan is wondering how much energy does it take to constantly swish their tail. Megan, I'd be lying if I could give you an exact number. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it's it's it, it'll be uh, almost instinctive reaction based on nerves. So it will just happen. Oh, look at all those low-flying swallows that are coming right next to the ground through the impalas. I can't really see which species. Actually, looks like it could be a European swallow. So some of them haven't migrated all the way back to Europe yet. I'm doing some last-minute gorging on bugs before. I wonder if you spotted one. No, just the impalas again. So you can see quite a lot of impalas. They're not moving about too much in this weather. I'm trying to stay on the nice open areas of quarantine where it's a bit safe in this wind. Bye bye, Impalalas. Yeah, so just away from the big herd, we have the boys with. Oh, oh, oh! Oh, oh! I think this could be a new bird for a lot of people if we can get him. Where did he go? I think this might even be a new bird for me on Juma. Come on, come on, come on. Where did you go? Where did you go? There he is on the other side. Where's he going? After him, Brian. Let's get a safety shot from a distance. Oh. Wow, look at that. That is definitely a new one for me on Juma. And definitely, I think, a new one for a lot of you. And he's got a kill. Now, let's see how good the birders are before I give it away. What bird is that? That is definitely not one I have seen on the live drives. What has he got in his beak? Oh, and the starling is trying to chase, chase him to steal it. Naughty starling. We're trying to look at a new bird here. Oh, the starling's chasing him again and again. Don't worry, we're on the hunt. There he goes. We're with him, Brian. Yep. Where's he going? Where's he going? Is he gone? Oh, dear. Oh. Aw. I think he's in that marua somewhere. Unless he used it to mask his escape from the starling. Anyway, so who knows what bird that was? I don't think Brian knows what bird that was, so I'm pretty sure that's a really nice new species for lots of people out there. Uh, so if you know what bird that is, pop an email uh, to questions at wildearth.tv to let me know, or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Now, we did have a reasonably good view of them there for a while, but remember to look at his beak. That's the hint, the beak. It's got a hook. Is. Maybe we'll 
that went not at all. Nonchalant reverse, so he doesn't think we're looking for him. There he goes. Ah, I've got him. There we go. Aha, the nonchalant reverse worked to treat. Oh, maybe. And off he goes again. There we go. We did manage to get. Female in distress. Being chased by the male. Oh, you lost him. You lost her. She left. Oh, he's going to come back, and there's going to be some other males on his on the way there. He might just chase them for the sake of chasing. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Get away from my ladies. Female coming back at speed, Brian. Now, will the boys with no girlfriends take advantage of a lone lass away from the herd? They're looking. Let's try to go a bit forward and see where she went. So this ties in quite nicely. Siberia is asking what age do Impala males start competing for the rat? She's on the move again. Will the boy? Oh, some of the boys are jogging in her general direction. But she is returning back to the herd. And back in amongst the females. So there we go. So we've got quite a few rams sitting here on the edge. And you can see the different horn sizes. So those guys, most of those guys in front of us are about two years old. That's going to be about three when they start competing for the rat. So next year, these guys are still way too young to think about it. But the guy to the right, he's in competition. And uh, now it's a constant ebb and change quite often with impala herds. So one of the ways they ensure good genetic diversity amongst the herd is that one male will mate with quite a few of the females. And then he'll get so tired and so skinny from chasing and keeping all the other males away. The next male sort of slips in and he falls into the bachelor group. And outside of the ratting season, they actually don't really mind too much who's with the girls and who's not, because there's no mating happening. So very well done to Bridget and Judy. Now I'm pretty sure this is going to be a nice new species for quite a few of you. And it was indeed the lesser grey shrike. There we go. Now and that was a beautiful shot, especially in this weather we could even see that sort of salmony pink which doesn't really come out in this picture there that is underneath. Uh, the lesser grey shrike, and it only really has that coloration at this time of the year. So, the fresh plumage. And there we go. A very nice bird, and definitely not one we've seen too many of. Um, I'm trying to think, Brian, have you ever seen one of those on a live drive? No, I don't think so. No, there we go. Brian hasn't seen one. Now, the branches are falling out of the trees around us. So, there was someone who said Sosa shrike, and you can see quite different coloration. Uh, and also, he only lives up in Namibia and Botswana and Angola. So unlikely to get the Sosa shrike here. The one that he's probably sometimes most... Oh, no, I'm pushing the wrong buttons, that's why. Um, easily confused for um, is, is probably uh, the common fiscal, which we don't get here as well. That's a middle felt species. The red back shrike. Um, if you see a juvenile, a lesser grey, you can sometimes get confused. But the lesser grey is quite a lot bigger. And if we look at the distribution, 
So it's only around, it's not around all months of the year, and he's going to be moving off. And you can see that dark blue part is where they're more commonly. So they're not as common uh, down here. We're down just above Swansea land there. So very, very cool. Yay. We've been getting some really cool new birds recently. I mean, the lesser gray shy, the white-throated robin chat. So you go in search of elephants and lions and you find lesser gray shrike and a very, very excitable male impala. Male impala reminds me of James when he sees a pudding. He really does love his puddings. So uh, every time I say impalalas, and I know that's not the real name, I get, I get, uh, it's uh, just a nickname I think we had for them when we were kids. And uh, uh, Aqua says she immediately gets hungry because she thinks of what enchiladas. Uh, so I do apologize for, for affecting your empanadas. So I do apologize for affecting your, um, your eating habits, Aqua. Uh, I'll try, I'll try not to do it too much. Aha. Now, I, this is very bad butterfly weather, but we have found a butterfly. You see him, right? Yeah. And that poor butterfly is hanging on for dear life in this gusting wind. Now, it is the butterfly we've been talking about quite a bit over the last week because we found the instar larval stage of it. It is an African vagrant. And it is busy hanging to a Chinese lantern tree or a sickle bush. And you can see a pollinated flower next to that butterfly. And you can see it's very white on top. And it's amazing, a lot of insects see color. So you can see that white is telling the insects that that flower is done, it has been pollinated, no need to come and search. So the, tr the, the bright pink one, there's a bright pink one, there should be a few there. They're always hiding behind, there we go, hiding behind slightly, is signaling to the insects that, yes, yes, I'm ready for pollination, come find me. Okay. Goodbye, Mr. Vagan. Hopefully the sun will be up shortly and you'll be able to continue in your search of nectar. I think, I think we need to get hot water bottles for winter, Brian. Mm, mm. Now, when I was guiding, there was a, a guide whose name I'm not going to mention, used to take a hot water bottle every game drive. I used to take one occasionally, but not every game drive. And he had a favorite hot water bottle. I think it was from his childhood. And we all warned him, that you should really replace your hot water bottles once a year if you <clears throat> use them regularly. And he did not listen. He's like, no, oh, it'll be fine. I love this hot water bottle. And uh, he actually burnt himself quite badly. And he was on game drive and he was sitting in his lap and he was talking to his guests. And he turned to say something and the thing burst open all over his leg. We, of course, being other safari guides, thought this was probably the funniest thing that happened the whole year. And although he did injure himself quite bad. Oh, another nice, interesting bird. I'm just going to wait for it to land. We'll get a safety shot from a distance. You get it there, Brian. Uh, I think it was a bit lower. Oh, where did he go? OK, has he come out? And there, you can see his big black tail. There. Uh, uh, Paradise wider. Very pretty bird. I'm going to try and get us a little bit closer. Now, we have seen a few of them, but they haven't been that common this year. Now, they're almost impossible to tell when they're outside of their breeding plumage. Don't fly! 
Oh, silly birds. Um, now, everything's a little bit nervous in the wind. Oh, he's got it. Brian's got it. There we go. Look at that massive tail. Now, for most of the year, he doesn't have uh, that tail, which makes him very hard to distinguish from other widers. And uh, he only has that tail to impress ladies, and only for that time of year. And it is a long-tailed paradise wider. And a bit of a difficult thing up there. So if we have a look, here we go. So there's the breeding male when he's in breeding plumage like he is now. And that's what he looks like outside of breeding plumage. And he doesn't have that massively long tail. So all that to impress the ladies. And the ladies are quite dull and gray, which is quite common in bird species. But uh, speaking of birds, it seems like Sam's got some other birds for you as well. have a grey luri, everyone. I've just been told by Brent that you saw the paradise flycatcher, oh, sorry, the paradise uh, wider. That's a beautiful bird to see. And what we have in front of us right now is the grey luri. It's a beautiful bird, and it's often a bird that you'll hear when you're tracking out in the bush felt and you're on foot, and you'll just hear this bird go, go away. Can't really do that well, but it's go away. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that's the grey luri, and I'll put a little picture here of the grey luri, otherwise Chirico, over here. So it has that very distinctive grey tuft at the top there. Um, the reason why I have OK, OK be there is also being seen in the Okavango Delta, and it's a beautiful bird, huh? it's really incredible. The Chiricos, and, or otherwise Luri, are some of the most magnificent looking birds um, in the bush vault. Where, where I was last year over here is the Meisner Chirico. Is, uh, it's a phenomenal bird. You can find that up in Hogsback in South Africa, which I would guess is probably around over there. Yeah, so it shows you the area that it's in. And you can go into the Meisner forests where apparently there are Meisner elephants there and you can find the Meisner the Mars the Chirico. And yes, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's incredible. I've actually been part of a regeneration pro uh, project of the indigenous, spe uh, indigenous species of trees that the Grey Luri would normally go to because it's, it's not the Grey Luri, so the Meisner Chirico. So, you know, with, with trees are very connected to the birds that go there. So we, it's, it's, it's an extremely beautiful bird to come across. And, and of course, we, I've seen, I, watched, I saw the purple crested Chirico when I was, uh, when I was at Londo Lozi. It's a beautiful bird that makes a very, very significant sound. Um, and I think it should be fine to play that bird call, do you think? It's not like it's here. Uh, so where is my that little device of mine? There we go. Yeah, it's, it's quite annoying that sometimes every time I play it, I've got a, the sound of the king. Actually, it's not annoying, it's beautiful. I love the sound of the fish eel. It's my favorite bird call. But this is the purple crested Chirico. was the purple crescent chirico. It's a very significant sound. You can often hear those at the top of some Timbuti thickets when you go into the bush vault. And it's uh, always a very, very, uh, it gets me very excited when I hear that, both that and the black-headed oriole. Hopefully, we're gonna have some time to see the black-headed oriole. But just to go back to the giraffes that we were seeing earlier, we can't see them now because they've gone a little bit into the bushes there, but. Yes, me and Jean Ray were having quite a laugh um, during this, this, this almost like a storm out here. I've never really seen wind blowing um, at such a pace out here, and the clouds are moving very rapidly. It's an it's a ominous and an extremely interesting environment, but 
during this little bit of a storm, we've been watching the giraffes having a very, very, very interesting encounter with one another. Uh, so they were trying to mate. The male was getting very close to the female, sniffing her, and quite literally following her wherever she goes. And never in my life have I ever been able to see, or have I seen, a male giraffe uh, mating a female. Um, and so that would be an amazing thing to see. So I'm just going to continue in this direction a little bit to see if we can see some excitement within mating giraffe. just asked a fantastic question which was are lions more successful when it is windy like this and you know I can only say yes you can imagine that the antelope and the other species the other mammals are very very confused with uh, with smells they can't smell the predators as easily um, you, know, as, you know if it's obviously upwind they can hear they can smell it but the wind confuses them dramatically so I can, I, yeah, I can only imagine that, that the, the lions are, are feeding right now. I would love to know where the